All right, hi everybody. I hope that you're doing well and that you had a great weekend. A couple of uh, little updates before I start with the slides. Um, my plan is to have the exams back on Wednesday with the idea of basically taking a week turnaround. <laughs> um, so that's what's going on there. I also posted an completely updated schedule for the rest of the semester um, where I uh, pushed around some of the ass assignment due dates and also included what was going on in lab just so that you have it all together. Um, right now, the only sort of big difference that you can see here is that I had us doing barrier immunity for two days. I have it for one. The topics otherwise have not changed. Um, I had the clinical immunology due on Friday. I moved it to Monday so that to make sure that you had a weekend. Um, it is also posted, so you could do it right now if you so desired. Um, well, I would like listen to class first, um, and also to make sure that it wasn't right on the same right at the, around the same time as the lab report draft. So you can see uh, this information here. Um, so basically, everything out for the rest of the semester is on this updated schedule, and this updated schedule is on Moodle. Um, and today, we're going to talk about immune memory. This is really a sort of continuation of some of the things that we were talking about last time in terms of the phases of a primary immune response. Also, just so you are aware, um, on Friday, uh, my mic pack that I was wearing died. So I have no audio for the recorded <laughs> lecture on Friday. So I do need to re-add to re in audio for that one. So that one will take a little bit of processing before uh, I can post it. So that's why that one is not yet posted. Um, but we were talking about phases of the primary immune response in that currently silent video. Um, and we talked about sort of some of the details of expansion and differentiation and important aspects of effector cells. We also talked about the importance of the contraction phase. Um, and we also mentioned that in a short period of time after one is uh, exposed to a particular antigen, after one is infected, um, they're still going to have that primary immune response that is at a high level, and that is going to protect them from infection. So I want you to remember back to the beginning of the semester, I talked about the difference between infection versus disease, that sometimes we can have inf uh, protection from infection, which means the microbe can't get in and establish at all, and sometimes we just have protection from disease where the microbe can't replicate very much, can't cause any damage. So at the beginning, um, you're going to potentially have actual protection from infection because this primary response is so high. Um, but that primary response is going to contract and is going to wane, and eventually you're going to be in this situation where you don't have that huge effector response. And of course, that is uh, related to the fact that effector cells are rather short-lived, um, as we discussed last time. They're sort of um, set up in a way where they can kind of do their thing really well, and that's all they can do, uh, and then they're, they die pretty quickly after that. Today we're going to be talking about sort of what happens out here um, and beyond. And so one of the things that you can notice, both on this image and on this image, is that after we have the contraction phase, the number of remaining cells specific to our antigen of interest is higher than it was at the beginning. So we can see previously perhaps we had one naive T cell or one naive B cell responding to our antigen. After this whole thing happens, we have, more, we have a larger number, more than one. We're not quite as low on our graph, and you can see that too. So we have increased 
our number of cells. Those cells that are still present at this point in time are also different than they were before. And so those are a type of cell known as a memory cell. Um, so some population of cells will live um, longer so that they are able to act as memory cells. Um, and you'll see some additional information about memory cells as we go forward. Um, trying to do something that my computer is cranky about, so we won't do it that way. We'll do it this way. Um, and one of the things that you should notice about the memory response is that, you know, it's this response that's persisting for a long period of time. But if those cells see antigen again, if those cells are re those memory cells are re-triggered, they are going to uh, increase in number. They're going to expand, and they're also going to differentiate much faster than the naive cells. And so here you can see there really isn't sort of a, a waiting period with this second immune response to making the, uh, response, the secondary response compared to what we saw the first time around. So memory cells can respond faster. Um, they also respond more. So we actually get a bigger uh, peak, a bigger increase in number. Um, and we have this a uh, really nice improved memory response. Um, this is all due to those cells at this point being memory cells. So the cells that are still around at this point are the memory cells. Um, so the memory cells are different than the effector cells. One of the biggest differences is that they are long lived. Um, so they're going to live a long time and I'll show you on the next slide just how long I mean. Um, they also are not going to have differentiated in the same way um, towards being an effector cell. One of the things that this slide does sort of a good job of showing, um, I will also show uh, more so later on um, another slide, but this slide in and of itself already shows this. Um, and this also might be one of those things where um, I did a PhD on T cell memory development <laughs> in response to viral infection. So I like spent a lot of time with this literature. So maybe that also might be why I like look at details of the slide because I'm like, I read all those papers. I know those papers really well, or at least I did. Um, there has been a fair amount of debate in terms of whether effector cells can become memory cells or whether the naive cells make some effectors and some memories at the very beginning. Um, and so I like that this slide kind of shows both instead of assuming one or the other. Um, realistically, the naive cell, uh, from I would say my understanding is that the naive cell makes some effector-like progeny and some memory-like progeny. The effectors all die and it's just the memories that are left. But that's been a debated thing in the field. So. Um, don't necessarily think that the effector cells turn into memory cells or something like that. Um, so as I said, the key thing about memory cells, or one of the key things about memory cells, is their longevity. Um, here we can actually look at some data on the longevity of memory responses. And many of the... Uh, uh, experiments that have been done on this have been done related to immune responses to smallpox. Um, the smallpox virus last caused a natural infection in 1977. Um, so nobody's immune system has seen it past then and really um, in say United States nobody's immune system has seen it since like 1960 probably or the 60s. But uh, people were getting vaccinated until the late 70s. And so what you can do is you can actually look and say, OK, we can track how long the smallpox memory cells are around. We know that you never got infected. So we know that those memory cells 
started their differentiation process the day you got vaccinated, which might have been in the 60s. And so we can actually know how long. It's not because you happened to get smallpox yesterday, because um, nobody got smallpox. We cannot really look at the trajectory of those memory cells. Um, when we do that, we see that um, if we look at antibody levels sort of over time, they stay actually pretty constant after their initial contraction. So we see some contraction, and then we pretty much see a relatively constant level. Um, this says that there's a half-life of T cells at about, of about 15 years. Um, we can also look at the difference between antibody responses. Again, right at the beginning, there's a really high antibody level, but we can see antibodies sort of persisting at a detectable level, which the people who didn't get a vaccine don't have detectable antibodies. People who did get a vaccine have antibodies that persist until the end of the study, which was 75 years. And you could, in fact, detect T cell memory responses out to 75 years. These are really hard studies to do. You can imagine a person who is 75 years post-vaccination is probably relatively elderly. You can also imagine that there probably aren't huge numbers of people who can be used, done in these studies. Um, so these are really hard studies. There's, there's a little bit of controversy. So I, have, I usually say we, can, we have observed memory cells up to 75 years post-vaccination. Um, it seems like they can pretty much be there forever. It doesn't mean the same cell who saw the antigen is still present. The idea is that that cell is undergoing some long-term uh, proliferation. So it, one of its progeny is still present. It may not be the same original cell. Maybe it is, and it was like a superstar, but it could just be the progeny of that original cell. Um, just like we saw with effector cells, there are differences between the naive, the effector, and the memory cells based on different proteins that they are making. So for example, let's see, granzyme B is not ba made by a naive cell. It's made a lot by an effector cell because an effector cell needs to kill. It's made a bit by the memory cell. The idea for the memory cell is that it's going to live for a long time and be ready to be re-triggered, not that it ready, needs to be ready to kill right away. We can also see similar things for fast ligand. Um, and we'll, we can see things like um, some proteins are lost as the cell gets activated. Um, so one of those proteins is CD62L or L-selectin that helps the cell go to a lymph node. So you want to go to a lymph node when you're naive. You don't want to go to a lymph node anymore, anymore when you're an effector cell. You want to go kill things. You can tell I did a PhD on CD8s. And my cell is always a CD8. Um, you might want to go to a lymph node, or you might not when you're a memory cell. Because maybe you want to go back and look for those initial infections. We can also see things like BCL2, which is important for cell survival. It's one of those apoptosis proteins or anti-apoptosis proteins you learned about from Dr. Dunaway. You want naive cells to live, but you really want memory cells to live. Um, and so memory cells will have more of that protein. Um, we also see more of this receptor that allows memory cells to get survival cytokines, particularly IL-7. This is the IL-7 receptor. That same old survival cytokine we saw way back during T cell and B cell development. Memory cells use that too to help them survive. So again, we see some big differences in um, these cells. Um, oops. And um, in general, we need a lot of signaling to get our genes turned on in a naive cell partially because that chromatin is uh, closed. Well, in either a memory cell or an effector cell, the chromatin is much more open, as you can see here. We have a lot of our signaling proteins pre-made, and so that cell has a much lower trigger. Um, it's going to um, not take as much to be activated. 
both memory cells and effector cells, as I told you last time, do not need signal two anymore. Um, once they've gotten their first activation, they're good. They don't need signal two anymore. Um, we're also going to see a lot more general cytokine production from a memory cell to help those memory cells survive. When we think about different memory cells, um, like frankly, when we think about immunology, um, we can further divide up the cells. And so there are different types of memory cells. Um, so this shows three different types of memory cells that sometimes we think about. Sometimes we think about cells that are called central memory cells. Central memory cells mostly spend time in the secondary lymphoid organs, like the lymph node. They are going to go back to the lymph node and look for their initial antigen, just like the naive cells were. They're sort of trying to do the job of naive cells of catching that first antigen in the lymph node, and then they're just going to do their job faster. There are some memory cells that are called effector memory cells that will circulate both through the secondary lymphoid organ, but will also spend some time outside in tissues. So you might imagine after a SARS-CoV-2 vaccination, you might get some central memory cells, or say, we'll say, we'll say SARS-CoV-2 infection here. You might get some central memory cells that go to your lymph nodes, that look for that virus again. But you're gonna get some other ones that are gonna go to the lung from time to time because the lung is where they found their first antigen. So they're gonna say, maybe the lung is a good place to look for this antigen. We're gonna look in the lymph node, but we're also gonna look in the lung. We also see resident memory cells that just spend time in the tissue which in this case, in the case of my SARS-CoV-2 infection would be the lung. They say, okay, I found my antigen in the lung. The place I should be looking for my antigen to come again is the lung. Um, these are, uh, we have understood kind of central and effector memory for a while. We are starting to understand resident memory more. I'm gonna show you a couple of things briefly, and then we're going to come right back to this slide. We can distinguish all of these different memory subtypes, as well as other ones that people are talk that have people talk about, based on their expression of different markers, Blythe flow cytometry, and so that's how many of them have been described. That was also something that was listed here in terms of the difference between a central memory or an effector memory cell. Um, the central memories, which are the ones that go to lymph secondary lymphoid organs mostly, have the trafficking molecules to go to secondary lymphoid organs. The ones that don't go to secondary lymphoid organs as much don't have those trafficking molecules. Um, and the amount of differentiation, how much signal they need to be triggered, things like that are different. So there is something very important that we need to think about when thinking about this slide um, and, and just sort of in general. One thing that I mentioned to you is that we've known and we know more details about central and effector memories than we do about resident. Um, resident are sort of a thing that are much more under study right now. So let's imagine that we think of some infection you had. It can be whatever infection you want to imagine. You can imagine any infection that you personally have had. And you want to know if you have memory T cells for that uh, particular pathogen. Let's say that first you want to measure some central memory slash effector memory cells. 
how are you going to do that experiment? Well, I haven't had SARS-CoV-2. We'll pretend it's my, I'll pretend it's a SARS-CoV-2 infection. How, how would I find out if I have central or effector memory cells against SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, Michael. So you're going to take a blood sample from me. And then what are you going to do? So I'm going to take, you're going to take some blood and then you're going to look and see if you can find T cells with the right proteins on the surface using flow cytometry to be called central memory T cells or effector memory T cells. Yes. And in fact, that is exactly what we do. Um, which one do you think you might find more of in that situation, in that experiment? Yep, Jay. Okay, you think effector memory. Why is that? You can see more of their time is in the blood. The central memories are spending a fair amount of time in the lymph node, right? If you really wanted to measure central memory cells, you'd probably have to take a lymph node biopsy to at least get a full view of what's up with central memory cells. Are you interested enough in knowing about your central memory cells to have a lymph node biopsy? That sound like a good time? Not really. So most of the time, we kind of use the blood sample, go with that. It's easy. But what if you had 50,000 people who you had to study? Say you were, I don't know, Pfizer doing a vaccine trial. You had 50,000 people, which is about how many people they had in their vaccine trials. What are you gonna, which of the two experiments we just discussed are you going to do with your 50,000 people? Yeah, Jameer. The blood one, why? It's quicker, it's easier, it's faster in terms of if you got to do 50,000 of them, you're not going to do something that's, gonna, something that's super involved. You're going to do this sort of simpler one, right? Where you can get OK info, right? OK, so what if I want to know now how many resident memory cells I have for, again, we'll say SARS-CoV-2, but it could be for whatever. How do I figure out how many resident memory cells I have? Yeah. So what tissue sample? Lungs. So some, I would actually have to give a lung sample. So I'd have to take a lung sample to look to see how many T cells there are. I will tell you from having ex done this by experience, when you start looking at tissues, remember how when you had the lab in the lab, you looked at the spleen and you had to smush up the spleen and put it through a filter and all that kind of stuff. Some other tissues are really annoying to get the cells out of. And they take like protease digestion and all sorts of work. Um, I used to, I was doing some vaccine vaccinations into the muscles of mice. I was putting vaccines into the quadriceps of mice. And so I would sometimes have to prep the T cells out of a quadricep of a mouse. Honestly, it looks like a milkshake. But like it's no matter how much protease you use, no matter how much you try to just, it's, it's it, bleh. that is not good flow cytometry. In any case, that's your lung sample. So it's going to be a sample that's not going to be that easy to work with. Do, does, does anyone want to give a lung sample right now? No. S sometimes we know how to do it where we don't actually have to cut out a piece of your lung. We can just um, make you snort a bunch of saline and then try to pipette the saline back out. Doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you see why we know less about resident memory cells? Now let's imagine that vaccine trial. Do you think resident memory cells are high on their list of things that they were going to look for? 
especially if they wanted to get that vaccine trial done fast so that they could vaccinate people in the, all the people of the world and get that vaccine out fast. Okay, we're, we're gonna come back to this, but remember that. So remember that some, ish, some things with the memory cells can be tricky because they have technical issues in terms of how you would measure them, some of them. Immunologists in general have done a lovely job characterizing what's in the blood but there are an awful lot of things not in the blood. Um, and those can be really hard to characterize. So the key thing about this response that is happening as a result of these memory cells is that we're going to see something called a secondary immune response. And the secondary immune response is much more potent than the primary immune response. So you can see there is an improvement. First of all, we started with more cells than we had before. So we were already in a better place quantity wise. But those cells increased really rapidly um, and were better at their function so that instead of say this virus replicating for a long period of time, we stopped that virus from replicating right away. Perhaps to the point where we don't have any symptoms. And so we have prevented disease even if we have not prevented infection. And this is generally how we say, how we talk about, you know, you can't get whatever, chicken pox or whatever twice. Um, because if you were to ask somebody a second time, they would say, oh no, I never had that infection again. I only had it the first time. If you did super sensitive testing and sequencing, you would find that, yeah, they did have it a second time. It was just it never got severe enough for them to be symptomatic. I point this out because I made this slide in 2009. You can see that the secondary, in the secondary immune response, there was a little bit of infection, but no disease. Now, the press likes to call that a breakthrough infection, and they're shocked that it happens. That, oh my gosh, you could have been vaccinated with SARS-CoV-2 and you could get infected again. Yup, that, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. But the idea is you're going to get a less severe infection because you have such a good memory response. The difference is that in 2009, we weren't testing people all the time for certain viruses and doing super sensitive sequencing. And so the only way you knew if you had gotten infected a second time was if you had symptoms. Now we're actually looking beyond the symptoms because of new technology and we can actually start to detect this infection. We always kind of knew it was there, but now we're actually measuring it. Um, if we had you decided to like spend our time doing hardcore se sequencing, we could have found it then too. We just didn't, but now we kind of have a reason to. Um, so if we actually look specifically at some of the differences um, with the primary response, we had a small number of specific cells. There are more of them at the start in the secondary response. There was that delay um, in the primary response that was not present in the secondary response. Things are already present. Um, in the primary response, we haven't done class switching yet. We haven't done affinity maturation yet. Um, we've already done those things by the time of the secondary response. So we're going to have really good antibodies present. In the primary response, it takes a lot to activate our cells. In the secondary, it takes less. We've got also got this delay um, with uh, T cells in the primary that we don't have with the secondary. And then in the primary response, um, the innate and the adaptive responses are a little bit more separate time-wise while they're happening at the same time and can work together more in the secondary response. Um, so just thinking about some details with regard specifically to secondary antibody responses. Um, what you'll see is that in a primary response, um, particularly at the beginning, you can see our lag, and then we see mostly IgM, um, and then we start to really get more of an IgG response later because we needed the time for class switching. Remember, all of our naive B cells start out making IgM. In that secondary response, we don't have the lag, and we also have IgG 
as our predominant isotype, uh, not so much IgM being made. And if we look at the affinity, we can also see that we have much better affinity of that IgG um, than we did of the IgM. Um, so those antibodies are great. You can see this from your textbook here. Um, so we have, it's really the same thing I've been saying. Secondary response, we have more cells. Secondary response, we're making our class switch isotypes. We have high affinity. We have a lot, we've already had somatic hypermutation. First time, we haven't had those types of things. And oh my gosh, it's the same thing again. <laughs> Um, though the one thing I will note is that we really are going to be seeing a lot of that secondary response with protein antigen because remember to get that good B cell response and to get B, help B cells become a memory B cell, differentiate into memory B cells, they need T cell help. And so we need to get the T cells to provide help, which um, is something that we largely see with uh, protein antigen. Um, we can also see um, a little bit of an effect in terms of um, different uh, mutations or different uh, genes. I told you a little bit about um, a disease called hyper IgM syndrome, where patients just make IgM and hyper too much IgM. Really the reason why they're making too much IgM is because they're making not enough of anything else they make like 100% IgM and 0% anything else. Um, and there are, we now know, we know of three different genes that can be mutated in those patients. One of them is CD40, one of them is CD40 ligand, where you can't get help um, from your T cell to the B cell. The other gene that was mutated in that disease is AID. Um, and you can see what happens in a mouse um, with AID here. So we can look at IgM levels and IgG levels in response to either first or second dose here in mice that either have AID or do not. So if we look at IgM, it goes up and then it goes up a little bit more upon the second immunization, kind of like Surprise, surprise, that's what it should look like. And if we have the AID deficient mice, kind of looks the same. Because remember, AID is important for somatic hypermutation and class switch. So we shouldn't really see a big issue with IgM. If we look, however, at IgG, you can see, and we don't have AID, you can see we have absolutely no AI, uh, IgG being made while we get this great increase in IgG in our normal mice. In these data, as well as in one other slide that I've already shown you, there is, in fact, another detail hidden. <coughs> Look closely here at the IgM data. And I want you to look at the IgM data after the second immunization. Is there anything that you notice about the IgM data after the second immunization? Yep, Carney. Aren't we supposed to see it less IgM? Why? Or where? So, so if we compare the amount of IgG versus IgM, we do see less. I mean, you can see it's way less than it is for IgG, certainly. There's something else that you can notice about these data. Yeah, Jay. Not quite. What were you going to say, Jameer? You're saying that the, the more we know AIDS, the more... Yeah. The, 
the one that can't class switch, the one with the ID, actually has more IgM than does the right normal. It's like there's extra IgM. It's kind of weird. If you look at this image that I'm showing you, when you look at a normal secondary response, it actually shows during the secondary response, you make less IgM than you did the first time around. It's not just that you make so much more IgG. You actually, the IgM went down, and you made less. So there's something weird going on about IgM levels during secondary responses. Almost like the IgG is suppressing the IgM. And when you can't make the IgG, you don't get that suppression anymore. Are, are you noticing that? OK. So who's making IgM for the most part? Who's making the IgM? Yeah, Michael. Yeah, so these, this is really more of a naive B cell, right? So the naive B cells are making IgM. The primary response, that's all you got. Who's making the IgG? mature or activated B cells. You know, it's only here later on do you have some of them to start contributing IgG. Here you've got a lot of them. Let's imagine we're, we're at, let's sort of think about this situation. We're in the lymph node. This room is the lymph node, OK? We don't have infinite amount of antigen. We don't have infinite amount of glucose. We don't have infinite amount of space. We don't have infinite amount of cytokines, right? So we have to kind of pick and choose who we're going to give them to. Who do we want to give them to here? Yeah. Which, which is made by who? We want, we, we want to give them mature cells that have act, already been activated. They've already done somatic hypermutation. They've already done class switch. We want to give them the resources. A certain amount where we want to be like, OK, naive B cells, we don't need you right now. We're going to let the grown-ups handle this. <laughs> right? That's kind of what we would ideally want to have happen. And so in fact, we do suppress the naive B cells during the secondary response so that we can make sure that there are plenty of resources for those activated B cells. And we can see this happening here. When a B cell is naive, it has an FC receptor on its surface. That FC receptor is specifically an FC gamma receptor. What does an FC gamma receptor bind? Don't all shout it at once. FC gamma. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, so an FC gamma is going to bind the FC region of IgG. At the beginning, the first time you see that antigen, there's no IgG around. So that receptor does nothing. Later, when you actually have some IgG around, 
that IgG will also bind to the pathogen and will bind to that FC receptor on the naive B cell. And that will actually lead to a negative signal in that naive B cell so that only the memory cells are going to be activated. Um, and we can sort of conserve resources for the memory cell, maybe not turn on those naive cells. The memory cell, it doesn't have the FC receptor. So um, it is not going to get inhibited by the presence of IgG. But the naive cell will get inhibited by the presence of IgG. This is just showing you that same negative signal coming from the FC receptor in another way. But it's, it's the same thing that you're seeing here. This is related to an issue that is currently like so very debated. I actually was really worried when I was putting together these slides because I touched this issue in two different ways in, this sli in these slides. And both times I touch it, I'm like, oh, God, do I really have to go there? Um, because it's, it's so messy right now, and it's so murky. And so I'm going to point this out, and then I'm going to say, I don't really know what's up. And the field doesn't know what's up. And I feel bad that this comment is going to end up on YouTube because it's probably going to come back and bite me. Anybody who says they know what's up on this, I don't think has looked at all the data. I, I think it's a big mess and is not super clear. And that is this question of um, something called immune imprinting. Whether the first antigen you see influences the second antigen you see. I mean, again, show you some, sli some slides on another part of this later. But this might make you say, well, yeah, if I get Omicron, I'm going to turn off naive B cells that might be specific to Omicron and just turn on the memory B cells responding to the original. Hmm. The data is really messy, and I don't know how much I believe any particular part of it when you put all the papers together. This phenomenon that I show you here is very important. It is clearly something that happens. There is a disease state I'm going to tell you about in a week or two that we ha can treat and basically cure based on this. So this is 100% a thing. <laughs> but when we get into real life and real microbes and things, it gets a bit messy. So what I'm telling, what I wanted you to see is if you have heard or read or thought anything about this idea of a previous immune response impacts a later one, this is one of the phenomena that plays a role, but there's a whole lot of phenomena that play a role and it's really messy. Um, we can also think a little bit about um, memory T cells as opposed to thinking about memory B cells. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, there is this sort of question about do the cells, do um, some effector cells turn into memory cells or do some naive cells turn into memory cells and other ones turn into effector cells? Um, I think this is actually more the way it goes uh, as I've looked at, from my read of the literature. Um, it's actually, there's this paper that's crazy cool that shows that when the naive T cell interacts with the dendritic cell, it turns its microtubules so that it can divide exactly in a plane like that um, related to the dendritic cell. And the close cell becomes the effector and the far cell becomes the memory cell. Um, and it's, it's this gorgeous paper. I love that paper. Um, 
so um, we do think that the cells are actually um, memory cells from the start. And we often think about memory cells as almost being like stem cells, where they can give you more effector cells. They can give you more memory cells. They can give you more of lots of different things. Where, as the effector cells are the most differentiated cells um, and have less and less of an ability to um, become other things. They can just be effectors and die. Whereas uh, memory cells, particularly more like the central memory cells, are uh, more stem cell-like and can make more memory cells, make some effector cells, make whatever you need. They're great. We also know that there are a lot of cytokines involved in um, allowing memory cells to develop. So in order to get memory cells to become memory cells, those cells need to receive certain cytokines. And in order for those cells to live for a long time, they need to get certain cytokines. Um, here you can see roles for IL-2, IL-15, and IL-7. Um, in particular, IL-15 is helping those memory cells become memory cells. IL-7 is helping those cells survive. Um, and it is just that general survival cytokine that our developing T cells and developing B cells wanted. All of the cytokines on this slide are cytokines that are part of the common gamma chain family. So I mentioned the common gamma chain family, this family of cytokines that all use one chain, the gamma chain, paired with other um, separate chains. So for example, IL-7 uses gamma chain plus an IL-7 specific chain. Um, IL-9, which is not shown here, uses the IL, uh, the gamma chain plus an IL-9 receptor. IL-2 actually uses the gamma chain in two other things. Um, so um, this family seems to be really important in terms of thinking about memory in general. Um, it has been shown by me um, that another member of this family, IL-21, is also really important. So just to show you kind of what this looks like, um, this is an experiment that I did uh, for my PhD. Um, and I infected mice with adenovirus um, at day zero and then at day 56, so eight weeks. Um, and I was looking for uh, the percent of virus-specific CD8 T cells. And if you look just at the purple, you can see I got a nice primary response. It contracted down. And then you can see I got a secondary response. Um, and it eventually contracted down. And then I actually did a whole bunch of uh, math to show that um, the slope here is different. So it is both a, it's not just that we started with more, the cells actually divided faster too, and they have better functions and all that good stuff. Hooray, immunology is true. Um, but I also used some mice that were missing the receptor for IL-21. IL-21, just like all those other ones, it has the gamma chain and the IL-21 receptor part. <laughs> um, and so I used mice that were missing that IL-21 receptor part. And in those mice, you could see I actually got the same peak for the primary response. It's hard to, hard to see that here. Um, though the cells seem to die a little bit quicker. But when I gave, gave the mice another dose, they made a primary response again. And these mice kept making primary responses instead of making a secondary response because those cytokines are so important for helping to make sure that the cells can actually become memory cells as they differentiate. So this is how you might examine something like this. All right, so for the rest of the time today, I want to talk through some kind of example situations. I don't know if I'm gonna, how many of my example situations I'm going to get through. We'll get through some. It'll be fine. Where we think about what we've seen with immune response kinetics and kind of try to apply that to some real world situations, some real world things that you might have seen. So we're going to be thinking about sort of this. 
but moving forward. So um, I showed you a piece of data on Monday, Friday, whatever the last time I saw you was. I don't know what day of the week it is. I showed you these data. And these are looking at antibody levels against SARS-CoV-2 following infection. And so you can see those antibody levels against two different antigens here. When we looked at these data, what types of things did we, what things did we say about these data? And we also noted what kind of the press or the non-immunologists say about these data. So let's remember what we talked about with these data from before. What do we observe, Michael? Okay, so if we just look at the data, we see antibody levels decrease over time following infection. And when we looked at this last week, we said, aha, it's contraction. We can see contraction, um, as we should. And we talked about that disease, ALP, ALPS, autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, where I showed you the, that girl who had those giant lymph nodes where her cells didn't contract, and that becomes a very severe autoimmune disease. We're like, ah, oh, contraction, as we should have. Hooray! And then we talked about the fact that um, there are uh, a lot of people who look at these data and panic. And you can read all sorts of articles in all sorts of newspapers about how this is the end of the world. The antibodies go away. Oh, no. Right? Um, one quick thing. How do we do this? How do we get this measurement? Yeah, Ermi? Okay, so you take a blood sample. It, it's, it's an ELISA like we did in lab last week, and it's off of a blood sample. Um, they're actually relatively rapid. They probably take a relatively small amount of blood, and um, it takes you know a couple hours max to do this. Okay? All right. So after I showed this, Two different people in the class came up to me after class and asked me a question. It was the same question. It was a perfect question. They wanted to know something else about what's going on here. And so what, and so again, we'll look, there's one month, six months, 12 months. What might you want to know if you're really thinking about these data in this situation? Yeah, Jay. Okay. Who's making these antibodies? What kind of what, what kind of B cells? What kind? Cells. We're, this is, this, these are the plasma cells, these are the effector cells that we're looking at. This is the products of the effector cell, the plasma cell, who's making boatloads of antibody. Remember that we talked about those effector cells are highly specialized to do their function, like make boatloads of antibody, but they're not very good at living for a long time. Oh my gosh, their products go away because the cell died. Shocker. Right? So based on what we have been talking about today, what's the question?
Yeah, cat. Okay, what does it look like after secondary infection? But what could, I, I don't really want to go around, so to, to do that, I would have to reinfect everybody. I'm not sure people want a second co time of COVID. So I can try to infer some things about secondary infection. How could I infer something about secondary infection? Yeah, Michael. Yes, but even before I did that, there's something else I could do. What, what if, so I, I just looked here and I said, I don't have a lot of effector, stuff from effector cells anymore. What if I did some flow cytometry to look and see if I had memory cells? We've been measuring the products of the effector cell, but really when we get out here, we care about memory cells. We don't care about effector cells anymore. So we just measured what happened with the effectors, but the question is, well, great, What's going to happen to me upon secondary infection or upon boost? And I can guess that by saying, do I have good memory cells? Do I have memory cells made? So here are some data looking at um, memory B cells over time after infection. And you can see that when we look at the memory B cells, they take a little while. In some cases, we're taking up to 90 days to get to peak numbers. But then they pretty much stay high for as long as they're measured. So what does this say to you? Remember, the world is ending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yes, at, right after you were infected, you had a lot of antibodies. And those antibodies could have protected you from infection because they were so high. Later on, you don't have those huge numbers of antibodies, but you have these awesome memory cells. And those memory cells are going to respond faster and better if you get infected to the point where you might not get disease. Um, these experiments take more sample. You have to have a flow cytometer. You got to um, take more blood. It takes more time to do these. People do these far less often. And so you can go to your doctor's office right now and say, doctor, what level of antibodies do I have? And they'll tell you like 17. And you'll be like, what does 17 mean? And they'll be like, eh. But anyway, they'll give you a number. You cannot go to your doctor right now and say, how many memory cells do I have? Because that's not something that's sort of easily measured in most clinical settings. You need to be in a research laboratory with research laboratory setups, and it takes longer. And so that's not something that was measured in the same way in certain vaccine trials. It's not something that we're measuring quickly and frequently. Um, and so whenever you hear about, oh, the immunity is going away, and death and destruction, know that that is a measure of the effector response. And that, in fact, every measure we've had of the memory response looks like a beautiful memory response. Um, and so the idea of what we're trying to do with the, what memory responses do is they just sort of shift what we see. So we might see with a particular um, infection that maybe some people are asymptomatic, some have a little bit of symptoms and we, going on and on. With the memory response, basically what's happening is we're getting more asymptomatic people <laughs> and we're sort of getting rid of the really severe infections. Because at the beginning, we had those nice effector responses where we could totally block infection. And at the end, we're mostly relying on the memory cells to help us clear that infection. Um, it's kind of like 
at the beginning, you focus on those tissue resident the antibodies that are more effector types of things. Whereas later on, you still have this backstop of all the memory cells protecting you, um, even after the effector things go away. So I think that this is one thing that um, people have been talking about a lot. Uh, there is one other thing that um, I'll mention that's sort of related to some of this COVID stuff. Um, so, and this is related to both what you see here and also kind of related to what you see here. Note that it takes a little while to get some memory cells. You don't have memory cells right away, right? So there is one thing um, in terms of COVID vaccines that immunologists have pointed out is not ideal. There are so many things that are gorgeous, such good work. There's one thing that's maybe not ideal. And we told, I get why they did it this way. And they, they did the right thing. But it's not perfect in a perfect world. What do you think happens? All right, so let's imagine. We got two people. who get an infection. Two people, identical infection, right? Now let's imagine that one of them gets infected again, right there. And let's imagine that the other one gets infected again right there. So you can see kind of sort of we're still kind of in the contraction-y phase versus we're way out in the memory phase. Could you imagine any differences in the secondary response and why? What might you guess could be different here and why? Yeah, Karame. So would it be that the possibly the antibodies are not completely gone on the first one? Okay. So maybe the antibodies aren't completely gone. And so then what happens? So then it'd be easier to find off the infection. Okay. So then what would happen with the secondary infection? You still got lots of antibodies around. So do the memory cells have to do much? No. Maybe. <laughs> How about here? Are the antibodies around anymore? So do the memory cells have to do much? <laughs> I ran out of height. <laughs> so maybe this situation, you actually get a better secondary response than this one. The other difference is, Maybe you didn't actually have time to let memory cells turn into best possible memory cells here. Because I showed you it takes a little while to get a good memory cell. Maybe they weren't like, they were like partially good memory cells. <laughs> and here they had time to be amazing memory cells before they saw the antigen again. Yeah? Yes. So you would, you would say, OK, if my second infection, my second exposure is maybe a little too close to my first one, I'm going to get a memory response, but it's not going to be amazing. It's not going to be as amazing as it could be. How does this tie into COVID and the COVID vaccine? Remember with the, what were you going to say? So I was going to say, like, if you get the vaccine, but then you get infected, like, after, or, like, a few days or mostly after you get the vaccine, you might still have those. Okay. 
So you can think about you know, getting vaccine, getting infected, but also remember when you got that original vaccine, you had to get two shots. They were three weeks apart. Three weeks? <laughs> People have done the experiment now. If you actually go out further, if you actually waited longer for that second shot, you get a better memory response. This is actually showing you short versus long in terms of their antibody responses. So if you have a long delay, there's more than if you had a short delay. The T cells are a little bit less clear. Um, this is why we need extra doses, third and fourth doses, because our first two were pretty close together. We were trying to get a vaccine to everybody fast. So we didn't have time to wait around. So we went for kind of like as long as we could to make it work, which was the three weeks. Because we were in an emergency. But if you were trying to make the most perfect, beautiful immune responses total, you would wait longer than three weeks. Um, and that's a big reason why we are needing so many extra shots is because those first two were so close together. Good news, they got us through the really bad stuff. Bad news, we need to do a little more to get a good memory response. Um, so we're gonna talk about barrier immunity next time, although I might tell you my other scenario story about chickenpox, we'll see.